Welcome. On June 22, 1941, the largest invasion of human history was launched by Nazi Germany against the Soviet Union. 3.8 Axis personnel were thrown into the Russian meat grinder against 3 million Soviet troops. In this video, I will talk about one of the largest battles to ever happen in human history in the first phase of Operation Barbarossa. It was just past midnight at 1 a.m. on June 22, 1941. Red Army soldiers stationed at the Soviet Western Front were suddenly woken up by the sound of intense artillery barrage and the sound of thousands of aircraft flying over them. At this point, none of them knew that one of the largest military encirclements in history was happening. They were going to be the first victims of German Blitzkrieg. This attack were going to be called the Battle of Bielostok Minsk. On the German side, we have the entirety of Army Group Center, composing of two infantry armies and two tank armies, for a total of about 750,000 men. On the Soviet side, we have the Soviet Western Front, composing of four armies, for a total of about 700,000 men. The Soviets mixed their infantry divisions and tank divisions into a single army whereas the Germans made separate armies for their tanks and infantry. And if you're wondering what this unit is, the horizontal line on this unit indicates that this unit is motorized, so this particular unit is motorized infantry. Bach's first major objective was to capture Minsk. In the north, Panzer Group III, commanded by the legendary general Heinz Guderian, attacked and pushed past the Niemann River. Panzer Group II attacked from the south, and penetrated up to 60 kilometers into Soviet territory. A huge cauldron was in the making. The 4th and 9th infantry armies followed closely behind and encircled the Soviet armies inside Bielostok. On June 23rd, not fully recognizing the situation, the Soviet 10th army launched a counterattack, which failed. Let's take a look at the situation on June 23rd. Looking at the situation in hindsight, the Soviets should have ordered a full retreat as soon as possible, and that might still be too late to prevent encirclement. On the night of June 22nd, Stalin ordered all forces to launch general counterattacks to thwart the German offensive. That obviously does not work, especially when your communications are completely broken down and the Germans have complete air superiority. The Soviets were getting their first taste of the German Blitzkrieg, and unfortunately, the armies of the Soviet Western Front will be their first victims. What you are witnessing now is the reason Germany conquered France in just 46 days. Back to this battle. After the first failed counterattack, Pavlov then ordered the mechanized units from the 10th and 3rd Army to launch another counterattack, which also failed. However, this attack delayed the German offensive and may have allowed more units to escape the encirclement. On June 25th, the 47th Panzer Corps from Panzer Group II advanced north and threatened to cut off the entire Soviet Western Front, forcing Pavlov to order all of his forces to retreat east to prevent encirclement. At the same time, Guderian's Panzer Army kept moving southeast and the 4th and 9th German infantry armies tightened their grip around the Soviet armies between Bielostok and Minsk. I'm sure you can see how desperate the situation is for the Russians right now. Keep in mind that the Germans had complete air superiority over this entire battle, meaning that German reconnaissance planes provide constant updates on Soviet troop movements. The Germans knew exactly what the Soviet troops were doing, and they can react very quickly. On June 27th, the pincer attack of Panzer Group 2 and 3 closed east of Minsk, the cauldron is complete and ready to start cooking. On June 28th, the 9th and 4th Army had linked up east of Bielostok and split the retreating Soviet forces into two pockets. The Soviet 10th Army was encircled in the Bielostok pocket, while the 3rd Army, 13th Army, and a portion of the 4th Army were encircled in the larger pocket west of Minsk. There were multiple breakout attempts by the encircled forces, but all of those failed and by June 30th, the pockets were completely shut off. Now, the liquidation process begins. The Germans took comparatively high casualties 
as they squeezed the pockets, but the Soviets took far higher. This was a grand victory for Germany, but the liquidation process took much longer than expected and the panzer groups had to wait for the infantry to catch up before moving onwards. This delayed the German blitzkrieg and allowed the Soviet commanders further to the east to catch a breath and reorganize their defense. General Pavlov and his staff were summoned to Moscow and executed for this defeat. There were many acts of heroism and stories from this battle. One of them was Ivan Bolden, who was the deputy to Dmitry Pavlov. He was caught in the Bielostok pocket but fought on for a month and a half after the battle was over. He then led a total of 1,650 men to break through the German lines and back to Smolensk. His actions made him a Soviet hero in the early parts of the war. In conclusion, on the Soviet side, 50,000 troops were killed, 76,000 wounded, and 290,000 were captured for a total of 416,000 casualties. About 250,000 troops managed to escape the encirclement. They also lost 4,800 tanks and 1,700 aircraft. Think about these numbers for a second. More than half of the 290,000 prisoners taken will die in Nazi captivity. This means that more than 145,000 of these Soviet men won't ever see home again. Then take a look at the amount of tanks the Soviet lost in this battle. 4,800 tanks. Germany and her allies started Operation Barbarossa with only 3,300 tanks. And many German tanks were older models like Panzer IIs and Panzer III's. The Russian losses for this battle were absolutely catastrophic. There was no specific record for the amount of German casualties in this battle, but it was less than 15,000 combined. Let's analyze this battle for a moment. Why was it such an epic failure for the Soviets? Was the execution of the Soviet commander Dmitry Pavlov justified? The German success is attributed to a few key points. First of all, the Germans had the element of surprise. Before Pavlov even knew what was happening, German panzers were already rolling around him and encircling his troops. The Soviets preferred to use telephone wires, and those were easily cut by the forward German troops. The total breakdown of communication meant that Russian commanders at the front lines oftentimes cannot locate their own soldiers and executing any order was very difficult. At this point, the Red Army has not experienced the domineering German blitzkrieg like Poland or France. They probably had an idea of how it worked, but they had no idea just how rapid and devastating it is. In hindsight, I think it's reasonable to say that the Western Front was pretty much doomed from the beginning. I don't think Pavlov was a terrible commander, and a Soviet high command would probably agree with me. However, Stalin needed scapegoats for this epic failure. And who could be a better scapegoat than the commander himself? The landmark in this battle worth mentioning is the Brest Fortress. The Germans managed to take this fortress without sustaining too many casualties, and the majority of Russian defenders surrendered. However, a few brave Russian soldiers fought on for many more months, hiding in various parts of the fortress. A famous icon of this engagement was a sentence carved onto a wall by an unknown Soviet soldier. It reads, I'm dying, but I won't surrender. Farewell, motherland. That's it for this video. In the next video, we will talk about two major tank battles that happened in the first phase of Operation Barbarossa. These tank battles involved over 5,000 German and Soviet tanks.